For most of human history, wealth was presumed to be finite. Consider a boy on a playground with 10 marbles. How can he get more? There is only one possibility. He has to take someone else's marbles. Until relatively recently, wealth was mostly in land, and the only way to get more land was to take it. Conquest was the natural mode of human acquisition. And that's how most countries evolved and grew through force and conquest. The American Revolution was motivated in large part by resistance to this old way of doing things. To put it mildly, the colonists didn't like the idea that the English crown could take their money or property without their consent. No taxation without representation, they protested. Still, the control of money and property was only part of the picture. The bigger challenge would be this. Could the New World find a better alternative to the Old World's conquest and seizure model? Alexander Hamilton, the first treasurer of the United States, had the answer. Under his brilliant stewardship, the new nation developed a new concept of wealth creation, capitalism based on innovation, invention, and enterprise. And it would be available to every citizen from any background with the willingness to work for it. America could get more marbles without seizing anyone's marbles. We would just make new ones. True, later in America's history, the government seized Indian land, but that wasn't Hamilton's idea. And obviously there were inventors and merchants around before America. But America is the first society to be based on invention and trade. America, as Karl Marx later understood, is the capitalist society par excellence. Hamilton was the man who made it so. Indeed, Hamilton's own life reflected the upward mobility. He wanted to be a defining characteristic of the new nation. Born on the small Caribbean island of Nevis, he was orphaned at 12. By 14, he was running a shipping company for a local merchant. At age 20, he made his way to New York. Soon thereafter, he fully embraced the revolutionary cause. By 23, he was George Washington's most trusted aide. At 34, he was running the U.S. Treasury, the largest department by far of the new government. In contrast to Hamilton, the other leading founders, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, were Virginia farmers. If it were up to them, America would have been set up as a network of farming communities, with towns conceived as places where agricultural produce was bought and sold. It was Hamilton who laid the groundwork for America to become a prosperous, urban, industrial, commercial society. Hamilton envisioned America as a nation whose nuclei would be cities, centers of vigorous invention, innovation, and trade with new types of people, entrepreneurs, mechanics, financiers, salesmen, and so on, all working to enjoy the pleasing reward of their toils. But how to create such a society? That was the question. How to make New York, which was then a modest town, into the New York City we know today, a flourishing center of finance, commerce, publishing, and the arts. Coming from the islands of the West Indies, where the buying and selling of human beings was the defining feature of the economic system, Hamilton well understood how easily the passion for conquest, control over other human beings could overwhelm man's better nature. Yes, slavery was a lamentable feature of the new country. The question for the pragmatic Hamilton was how to get rid of it. Not immediately, that was impossible, but eventually, inevitably. In his mind, there was only one way, make it as easy as possible for as many people as possible to become as prosperous as possible. This would happen through the myriad ways of commerce. A commerce of this sort, Hamilton knew, would require a strong central government not to curb freedom, but to protect it. The elaborate system of rights and contracts on which capitalism is based require a government to be the neutral arbiter of the disputes that inevitably arise. A weak central government of the sort envisioned by Jefferson would not be up to that challenge. To say that these two intellectual giants butted heads over this question would be an understatement. Fortunately, Hamilton's vision prevailed. That vision included one more crucial component, one that is easily overlooked. Patent protection for inventors and innovators. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors 
the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. No less a figure than Abraham Lincoln would note that this right, the only right listed in the original Constitution prior to the addition of the Bill of Rights, accelerated the economic development of the United States by adding the fuel of interest to the fire of genius in the discovery and production of new and useful things. It was no accident that within a matter of decades, the United States became the most prosperous nation in world history. It's no accident because Alexander Hamilton was there at the founding, the man who understood that thanks to capitalism, you don't have to take anyone else's marbles to get more marbles of your own. I'm Dinesh D'Souza for Prager University. Self-made men existed before America, but they were rare. After the American Revolution, they became much more common. They came from everywhere. They are still coming. Benjamin Franklin was and remains the prototype. One of his recent biographers, Walter Isaacson, put it this way. He was the most accomplished American of his age and the most influential in inventing the type of society America would become. Franklin's life, no less than his ideas, conveyed the indomitable spirit of both invention and, just as important, self-invention that define Americans and make them almost instantly distinguishable, even today, by people around the world. Born in Boston in 1705, the youngest son in a family of 17 children, Franklin was at various times America's leading scientist, inventor, diplomat, writer, and publisher. It's hard to imagine one person could accomplish so much in one life. He conducted early experiments in electricity, devised bifocal glasses, designed a new type of stove, organized lending libraries, formed Philadelphia's first fire department, and founded the college that became the University of Pennsylvania. His own formal education was two years of high school. His informal education, what he taught himself and learned from others, never ended. His poor Richard's Almanac, which dispensed practical daily wisdom and wisecracks in equal measure, was the most popular publication of its day. If there was something important going on, Franklin was in the middle of it. He was the guiding spirit of the American founding. He desperately tried to keep America out of a war with Britain, offering the British government every kind of compromise to avoid the conflict. But when his efforts were rejected and he realized separation from the mother country was inevitable, he threw his heart and soul into the revolutionary cause, the struggle for independence. As the American envoy in France during the war, he was more responsible than any other person in bringing the French to the American side. Without this alliance, it's unlikely the rebels would have won. It's more likely, in fact, that they would have lost, and all the founders, including Franklin, would have been tried, convicted, and executed as traitors to the British crown. When the new country won its freedom, Franklin, then in his eighth decade and near the end of his life, was again on center stage, helping to guide the quarreling delegates toward a new constitution, a novus ordo seclorum, a new order for the ages, he called it. At a low point in the great Philadelphia debate over the nation's founding document, when everyone, including Washington, was willing to give it up as a bad job, Franklin single-handedly saved the enterprise and revived the spirits of the delegates by summoning them to an inspirational prayer. And it was Franklin who summed up the event for posterity. When asked what kind of government the convention had created, he quipped, a republic, if you can keep it. Franklin viewed America itself as a great invention, a new kind of nation for a new kind of man. Even so, Isaacson concludes, the most interesting thing that Franklin invented and continually reinvented was himself. His brilliant autobiography reveals a polymath who was endlessly curious and endlessly and pleasantly surprised by life. He was also never quite satisfied in a way that is, again, quintessentially American. He sought to make it, whatever it was he was working on, better. So he saw construction workers with axes building a fort and timed them to see how long it took, inquired into the art by which native Indians conceal their fires, conducted experiments and published his observations on electricity. Franklin took this curiosity and turned it on himself. He viewed his own life not simply as a story of change, but rather as a continuing quest for self-improvement. 
He describes in his autobiography how he made a list of what he termed the seven virtues, temperance, industry, sincerity, and so on, and then enumerated them in a single column down the left-hand side of a page. At the top, he listed the seven days of the week. His plan was to take the first virtue and practice it for one week straight. He noted his progress each day with a check mark. If he could practice a virtue for seven days without a lapse, he reasoned he would internalize it. It would become part of his character. And as his life suggests, it worked. This wise, self-deprecating, life-loving man was an American original. And yet he was also the progenitor of an American type, one who follows his own path. Benjamin Franklin types from all over the world came in droves to America because this was the place where they could best pursue their passion. In America, class didn't matter, country of origin didn't matter, level of education didn't matter. All that mattered was talent, hard work, and luck. In America, you could make of yourself what you will, and you still can, just as Benjamin Franklin did. He is the original embodiment of the American idea of the self-directed life, an idea that still defines the American experience. I'm Dinesh D'Souza for Prager University. The preamble to the American Constitution begins with the phrase, we the people. But could the people of America be counted on to do the right thing all or even most of the time? The principal architect of the Constitution, James Madison, gave this question a great deal of thought. His answer was a decided no. Whenever there's an interest and power to do wrong, he said, wrong will generally be done. For his new nation, Madison wanted as much freedom as possible with as little government as possible. But he had no illusions. Tyranny, he knew, comes in many forms. It's not confined to monarchies and dictatorships. In democratic society, the threat of tyranny comes from the people themselves. The founders call this the tyranny of the majority. The majority will, if it can, put its own interests above those of the minority and generally not hesitate to deprive it of its rights and freedoms. This is why Madison was preoccupied with the problem of what he called factions, the word he used for any kind of organized pressure group. Madison deemed both minority and majority factions dangerous, yet of the two types of factions, he considered a majority faction to be more dangerous. Why? Because minority factions can be curbed by the power of the majority. But who will curb the majority? This is the central purpose of the Constitution, to limit, frustrate, and in some cases block majority rule. As Madison put it, the great task was to devise a document that would first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. How to do this? Madison had a plan. First, the Constitution had to be written down. We're so accustomed today to national constitutions that we need to remember that prior to the American Constitution, no country in the world had one. And since the adoption of the U.S. Constitution, many countries have had constitutions that came and went, some lasting just a few years. Yet the American Constitution has now endured for nearly two and a half centuries. The original document was written on four pieces of parchment and is 4,543 words long. Its remarkable brevity perfectly matches its purpose to create a framework for limited government. To Madison, this meant that the authority of the federal government should cover certain listed or enumerated areas. Outside those areas, the government has no authority. Second, the rights of the citizens had to be spelled out. That's why the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, known as the Bill of Rights, contain a series of limitations on government. The rights in the Bill of Rights typically begin, Congress shall make no law. Congress shall make no law restricting free speech or freedom of the press or the free exercise of religion. Third, the concept of representative government had to be clearly defined. Representative government means that the people do not rule directly. They rule by electing representatives who govern in their stead. Madison counted this practice, a radical departure from the direct democracy of the ancient Athenians, as the distinguishing mark between democracy and a republic. A large and extended society, Madison argued, can function effectively only as a republic. 
And a republic is a much better guard against tyranny of the majority than a democracy, in which, by definition, the majority can do whatever it wants. Fourth, the power within the government must be divided. The Constitution separates power between an elected legislature charged with making laws, an elected executive charged with enforcing them, and an appointed judiciary empowered with resolving legal disputes. A further division happens between the national government and the states, so that some powers are exercised at the national level, others at the state and local level. Fifth, mutual oversight checks and balances was necessary to restrain the power of the individual branches. Because Madison understood how easy it is for a country to devolve into tyranny, he ensured that each of the three branches of the government act as a check on the power of the other two. Congress has the power to make laws, but the president can veto them, and vetoes can be overridden only by congressional supermajorities. The president and his executive branch enforce the laws, but there is congressional and judicial oversight. The judiciary interprets the Constitution and the laws, but judges are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. This is not a complete list, but it gives a clear picture of Madison's ambition to give America a political system that would promote freedom by making it very hard for the human appetite for power over others to ever be realized. He succeeded thus far. I'm Dinesh D'Souza for Prager University. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the shared goal of every American. The U.S. Constitution was written to make it possible. We all have a pretty good idea about what life and liberty mean, but what about the last part of the phrase, the pursuit of happiness? That's a little harder to pin down. Let's give it a try. The 17th century English philosopher John Locke spoke narrowly of the rights to life, liberty, and property. The Declaration of Independence widened the scope to something far grander, the quest for what Aristotle termed the true end of all human endeavor, happiness itself. We think today of happiness in relativistic terms, something each person pursues in their own way. For example, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, Polonius advises Laertes to thine own self be true. In other words, be yourself. We hear this a lot today. To John Adams, America's second president and a seminal figure in the creation of the country, this was bad advice. For Adams and the founders generally, happiness was a modus vivendi, a way of living expressed by how one conducted oneself, especially in public. Adams understood that people are an imperfect amalgam of the admirable and the abominable that being yourself does not automatically lead to good character. It's more likely, in fact, to lead to self-absorption. The only way to attain a good character is, like everything else, to work at it. The best way to do this, Adams contended, was literally to imagine a noble character. Here we're talking about character like a character in a play, and then strive to become that character. Walk like that character, think like him, feel like him, act like him. Over time, through the result of continual effort and the slow working of habit, one can become that person. Adams practiced what he preached. In this way, he became a public figure, both incorruptible and unfailingly honest. He became the best version of himself. This takes us back to the founders' conception of happiness. They subscribe to the Aristotelian belief that genuine happiness is achieved when the activity of the soul is in perfect harmony with virtue. None of the founders reflected on this idea more than John Adams. Not only did he want his own life to be defined by virtue, he also wanted the infant republic to be built on it. Without virtue, he believed, America could not succeed. Today, the term virtue seems anachronistic, a notion from the past. But to Adams, America's survival as a free country depended on it. The preservation of liberty, he wrote, depends on the intellectual and moral character of the people. As long as knowledge and virtue are diffused generally among the body of a nation, it is impossible they should be enslaved. In a monarchy, Adams noted, the people don't need virtue. 
They can be as vicious and foolish as they please because all political responsibility lies in the hands of the king and his retinue. In a republic, however, the people are the government. So the virtue of the state is a reflection of the virtue of the people. Given that human nature is deeply flawed, this created an obvious problem of which Adams was painfully aware. I have seen all along my life, he observed, such selfishness and littleness that I sometimes tremble to think that although we are engaged in the best cause that ever employed the human heart, the prospect of success is doubtful, not for want of power or of wisdom, but of virtue. How could the new nation develop a virtuous citizenry? A devout Christian with enormous respect for the Jews and the Hebrew Bible, Adam certainly saw belief in God and fear of his judgment as indispensable. So was a proper education. But he did not think that these were enough. A virtuous government would also be necessary. Here is where a clearly delineated and easily understood constitution would be essential, and no one worked harder than Adams to create one. His focus was to give citizens the ability to thwart the conniving, corrupt, power-lusting politicians for which he had so much contempt. Once identified, they could simply be voted out of office and better people could take their place. Additionally, good government would attract good people, capable leaders whose ambition could be enlisted on the side of virtue. Arguably, we are a long way from having the kind of leaders elected by the kind of people that Adams wanted the American constitutional system to help create. And we are more likely to think of pursuing happiness in narcissistic terms than in the way Adams and the founders perceived it. Perhaps it is only by reflecting on our political problems as a reflection of flawed human nature and on Adams' proposed remedies beginning with the development of good character in each citizen, that America has a chance of finding its way back to the path on which the founders so wisely and deliberately placed us. I'm Dinesh D'Souza for Prager University. In one sentence, Thomas Jefferson not only laid the foundation stone for a new nation, he also set that new nation, the United States of America, on a path we still follow today. His affirmation in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights may be the most influential words ever written this side of the Bible. The U.S. Constitution, ratified a little more than a decade later, was guided by those words. Subsequent amendments, including the 14th Amendment passed after the Civil War, granting equal rights under the law, seem, for all their grandeur, to be restatements of the equality principle in Jefferson's original declaration. Yet Jefferson is controversial today because he embodies the contradictions of the founders. Indeed, progressive scholars say he was the worst of them, the most hypocritical, because the very man who insisted that all men are created equal not only permitted slavery, but himself owned slaves. Did Jefferson not see the glaring contradiction between his principles and his practices, between the principles and practices of the infant American nation? According to Chief Justice Roger Tawney, who authored the notorious 1857 Dred Scott decision affirming slavery in the territories, neither Jefferson nor the other founders could have seriously meant that all men are created equal. They didn't act on the principle, so they couldn't have believed it. Modern progressive jurists such as Thurgood Marshall, as well as historians such as John Hope Franklin have, again with an irony that should not go unnoticed, adopted the tawny view. In Franklin's words, the founders betrayed the ideals to which they gave lip service. They wrote eloquently at one moment for the brotherhood of man, and in the next moment denied it to their black brothers. No defense of Jefferson or the American founding is possible that agrees with this assessment. How then can Jefferson and the founding itself be vindicated against this most serious charge? For the answer, let's look again at the Declaration and what comes immediately after the statement, all men are created equal, that governments derive their legitimacy from the consent of the governed. This is the democracy principle, and it is no less important, no less foundational than the equality principle. 
With this in mind, let's turn to the practical choice faced by the founders. Progressives say they should have outlawed slavery in the original Constitution. Yet slavery was legal in all the states that sent representatives to Philadelphia in 1789. How could these representatives outlaw slavery without the consent of the people in their states? Were they expected to do so by overriding popular consent? In that case, they would be overthrowing democracy itself before it was even introduced as the bedrock of the new constitution. Furthermore, as everyone in Philadelphia knew at the time, many states would not have joined a union that forbade slavery at the outset. Perhaps a few would have done so, but no more. Had those who opposed slavery held firm on the issue, the union would have consisted of a handful of states, or it would have remained a utopian idea affirmed by a group of high-minded founders, but they would be founders of nothing. As Jefferson himself said about the slavery issue, we have a wolf by the ear, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. It is not reasonable. In fact, it is downright obtuse to ask of statesmen to do what they manifestly cannot do. It is only reasonable to ask them to make the best choices available to them under the circumstances, to hold the wolf in Jefferson's own terms until he can safely be let go. In Abraham Lincoln's view, the American founders did just that. They temporarily allowed slavery in practice while constructing a framework based on anti-slavery principles. In Lincoln's words, the founders declared the right so that the enforcement of it might follow as fast as circumstances would permit. Lincoln's interpretation of Jefferson and the founding was echoed by runaway slave and brilliant abolitionist leader Frederick Douglass. Slavery, Douglas said, was merely the scaffolding for the new Constitution, allowed provisionally by Jefferson and the other founders, but with the clear objective that it would be taken down once the edifice no longer needed it. Martin Luther King echoed these same sentiments in his famous I Have a Dream speech. That Jefferson didn't live up to his highest values is not in dispute. But to deny his greatness and his indispensable role in the creation of the nation is both narrow-minded and foolish. His declaration undergirded the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, and to this day it remains the anchor of our rights and our democracy. Lincoln, Douglas, and King all understood that Jefferson created the pathway for America to become a better country than it was at the start, a country in which the glorious idea that all men are created equal is closer to reality than anywhere else in the world. I'm Dinesh D'Souza for Prager University.